This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for the Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. Do take a couple of moments to be sure that you're subscribing to our channel, that you like us. Perhaps you can even ring the bell or something to be sure you're notified of additional uh, information that when we put out new podcasts or, or a vodcast, I guess that's what I'm doing here. Also, do take some time to drop me an email at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear your comments, thoughts about the show, and uh, ideas for future shows that you'd like me to research for you. I'd be certainly love to hear that information because otherwise, as I said before, if you're following the podcast, otherwise I'm telling you what I'm interested in. So, so far that seems to be uh, what most of you are certainly uh, happy with, and so I'm glad to have you on board. Uh, also, if you have comments, critiques, interests, uh, topics for other shows, such as if you have a, a new product that you've d- developed or perhaps something you want to market, do reach out to me. Again, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. All right. Well, normally I spend a lot of time, of course, on rodents. My last podcast, of course, was on bromethylene. We'll get back to some anticoagulants. But uh, as we're moving into fall uh, here in Montana, we have cherries, right? So certainly late July is kind of a late, uh, well, actually not late July. I should say late August, mid-August. We have cherries here in Montana, and uh, we're quite famous for them up in the north northwestern flathead region, flathead cherries, or I think that's not the technical term for them, but anyways, you'll see stands out where people are selling them, and I understand they're quite delicious. I'm not much of a cherry person myself, but many people enjoy the fruit, and of course, bird damage can be a problem for cherries. Now, wildlife control operators, as a rule, don't really do a lot of work with with agricultural areas. However, I suspect there is a small portion of you out there that do have some agricultural issues. You wanna learn a little bit more about bird control dynamics in a more ag or semi-ag environment. As some of you would know, there's a tremendous push among certain elements of our society to try to go back to an organic period of time. And so these are the, these kind of micro farms can be developed. And so you may be finding individuals who are in desperate need of bird control in a more ag environment, but it's not big ag, right? We're not talking about thousands of acres or even hundreds of acres. You may be dealing with a dozen acres or something like that. So bird damage to fruit trees is a tough problem. Now you may say, well, Stephen, I got the answer for that. You just simply net it. And you are exactly right. Netting is definitely the platinum standard for eliminating damage to trees caused by birds. Without a doubt, netting is number one. However, it's also extraordinarily expensive. It is time consuming and it's difficult to do. And so many of your producers simply don't have profit margins high enough to sustain that. Plus the nets get damaged. You have to keep moving them out of the way if you're gonna try to harvest. Uh, or if you need to spray for various reasons, it, it's a real, real hassle. So if someone is just as a has a single tree in their backyard and they're trying to protect it from birds, yeah, probably netting is at a price point that's certainly proud about. How do you do that when we're dealing with a couple of acres of trees, right? So this is an article written by Mark Tobin and Richard Dolbeer, Carol M. Webster, and Thomas W. Siemens. These individuals, at least the first two, uh, actually the first two in the last one, are part of the USD National Wildlife Research Center in Denver, Colorado. Now, if you're not familiar with that organization, uh, that is some of your tax dollars at work 
they receive approximately 10% of all the funding that USDA Wildlife Services receives. So I understand there's uh, some parts of the country there's tremendous animosity against USDA Wildlife Services because wildlife control operators see that as a competing agency to their business. In other words, how why can a government agency come in and do a job when they could have hired your company, for example, to do the work. And so there has been some issues in the past and perhaps still going on, but certainly when I was a little bit more tightly connected with uh, an organization, there were some complaints back probably 10 years ago that got probably a little heated, and certainly where people were claiming that they lost contracts or work or even the, sometimes the possibility to even bid for jobs because they were competing with wildlife services that a state agency simply hired wildlife services without even putting something out to bid. Uh, I, I'm not getting into that other than just simply to say that understand if you are have animus against wildlife services understand that if you want them eliminated are you wanting the research arm of wildlife services eliminated as well my suspicion is you probably don't even though granted a lot of their research really has to deal with agricultural uh, in large landscape issues, airport issues, where a lot of wildlife control operators aren't really present right now. They're not really doing a lot of structural type work. So uh, that could be an issue, but they do research on baits and certain types of repellents and even uh, pesticides as well that are related for vertebrate work. So uh, just keep that in the back of your mind when you're arguing that maybe you don't want USDA Wildlife Services completely defunded. Maybe you just want the field services defunded and maybe you want the research arm to continue to be funded. I'll leave that up to you as a, as a political issue. That's not really the topic of my presentation today. I'm just letting you know that this is some research that was done by some of your tax dollars, right? So. USDA Wildlife Services, they have some outstanding scientists up there, and this is some of the work that they do, and they're obligated to take that information and publish it to the wider community to try to improve agricultural production in the United States. And also they deal with disease issues as well. So this is one that was published in 1991. You say, ah, Stephen, it's so old. Yeah, it's old, but it doesn't mean it's not still relevant unless you think birds have somehow changed their behavior in the last 30, 40 years, okay? So in any event, what they were doing is this study took place in New York State. Now, New York State obviously has cherry orchards, and so they were doing work among cherry orchards up here in, in the state of New York. So if you're, and the point is, is, I want you to understand whether you have cherries grown in your neck of the woods or not, that's not the point here. And if, if you do, then great. Then this, this article will be spot on for you. However, even if you don't, there's going to be techniques and principles inside this article that are going to be helpful for you. I'm, and I'm not asking you to read it. I'm just simply, I'm going to be kind of summarizing some issues here for you. But I don't want you to say, oh, cherries. We don't have cherries here. Let's turn the podcast off. No, that's not what this is about. Sometimes when you're reading techniques to control animals in one context, you get ideas and principles for how to control those animals in a different context. And that's my point here. So you need to kind of abstract a little bit. So even if you don't have cherries, perhaps you have apple orchards where you grow. Perhaps you have pecans where you grow. And so I want you to be thinking about how can I use the principles of this article on cherries to protect my client who has oranges or apples or pecans or wal or whatever, whatever they're growing in a tree? And I would argue that you will learn some things here that will definitely help you think conceptually about an attack plan to give your client some options on how to manage the damage from birds on these trees. All right, so there we go. So what they were looking for here, again, what, let me set this up. Cherry trees in the state of New York, they were evaluating. Now they wanted to identify, they wanted to try to test out a particular repellent. The repellent's not important here because it's not legal anyways, all right? Turned out the repellent had no real difference between 
the damage where the repellent was placed and the trees that weren't didn't have repellent so they even so they that was a wash it didn't matter so the repellent is irrelevant here what they looked at however was the various cultivars like the different varieties of cherries and how birds attacked those cherries now this particular chart here or graph or table i guess i should call it talked about when these particular cultivars were harvested now notice what we have now here in here in new york they were harvested relatively early right so we're talking about a june 5th to a june 27th harvest date and those are mean harvest dates obviously some trees would be harvested earlier some trees would be harvested later but the point was that certain cultivars ripened sooner than others okay and what they found was was that the trees that ripened early were more heavily attacked by birds they suffered significantly more damage than the trees that ripened later in the summer so this was important to understand so they were basically pointing out well why is this the case is it simply a ripening issue because what they pointed out here was they needed to evaluate were there other reasons for the trees being damaged and this is what they were asking this is what they were asking they pointed out here that sometimes a tree can be damaged if it's nearby if it's in close proximity to a flock of birds and they said is that the case in our field and they said no they never identified a big flock of birds somewhere okay so that eliminates that problem they said well maybe a tree could trees could be maybe these cultivars were damaged because they were near another tree that was desirable but maybe wasn't ripened enough and then they said no that's not it because all the tree the different cultivars were intermixed through the orchard in other words the 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 farmer didn't have one row of cult one cultivar and another row of another cultivar he mixed and matched these cultivars all throughout the field so that wasn't it so then he was then they were thinking well maybe maybe we're gonna have um let me get to my spot here a little technical trouble sorry for that so maybe they said the problem maybe the color of the fruit and was the issue maybe some cherries were of a darker color which maybe maybe told the birds they were more ripe and therefore they got hammered more and what they showed they said no there was no difference in the consistency with respect to color and the damage in fact the trees that were damaged earlier or the cultivars that were damaged earlier they said actually had only a slight blush of red when they were ripe so it certainly the birds weren't attracted to the color something else had to have happened and the bottom line here was is they found out that trees that ripened early were more likely to be damaged and damaged significantly than the trees that ripened later now let me look let's look at some data here let me kind of pull up to some of this data for you okay pull this up here so you can get to it don't know why the computer's acting kind of weird today all right so let me blow this up so it's really so it's much easier for you to see now notice what we have is geneva actually no early river geneva black tartarian those three suffered significant damage notice what we have here early river they couldn't get a mean harvest date because the the birds just ravaged it now they only had one sample tree there so that obviously was a problem they didn't they weren't able to replicate the study as much but notice how the birds took out a hundred percent of the cherries on that tree that's some serious damage geneva which again is a cultivar the mean harvest date was june 5th there were two trees sampled they suffer it's those trees suffered 60 percent damage and as you go farther down the list, however, when you look at held, 
Haldelfingen, which had a mean harvest date of June 27th, they had four orchards and 30 trees sampled. Notice only 3.7% of the trees were damaged. or the trees that were damaged had suffered an average of 3.7%. The standard error, however, you know, was almost twice as much, so the 7.5, so some trees got hammered a little bit more, some got hammered a little bit less. There's a little bit of variation there. That's what standard error is. The grand mean of all the trees was 20, almost 21% with a standard error of 8.7%. So plus or minus 20, 29% to around 11%, that's what the, what the range was of what trees damaged. Some suffered as high as, on average, some suffered as high as 100%, some suffered as low as 2.5, actually 0.5% damage. So, the bottom line here is, is that understand that timing matters in that perhaps what are going to be some strategies if you were to talk to a producer, how would you communicate to a producer what they should do to reduce this problem? Well, one solution would be change to cultivars that ripen later. Okay, that would be a major loss because growing trees to produce fruit takes a lot of time, right? So that would mean they would have to start from ground zero again. Now, but that's an option. Another option would be is to net the trees that ripen early to give them a little bit of protection. That would be a subset of all the trees, right? You wouldn't need to, you wouldn't need to net the trees that ripened later you would need to ripen trees, you need to protect trees that ripen earlier. Another option would be perhaps getting control of those birds. Perhaps we'll say they're non-protected species birds, perhaps making sure that you're doing initial, enough control, frightening devices, perhaps coupled with some lethal control. Again, following all of your federal and state laws, of course in that that may that you just know you have to time your control earlier to be sure that those birds aren't going to come and attack those trees as they're getting ripe. The rule of thumb with bird control is that the birds will if you're going to harvest on day 3, the birds are going to attack it on day 2. They're always there at least a day before you are. So another option would be can you move up your harvest dates? Notice those principles can apply to any fruit tree you're, you're, you're seeing, whether we're dealing with cherries or not. So these are the types of questions you need to be asking a producer. Do you notice, producer, are there certain cultivars of your crop that are being attacked more aggressively than others? And, you know, here's the problem. Your farmer may not know. Your farmer may not be paying enough attention to noticing the damage. The research shows that producers do not notice damage until it reaches 5%. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that you wouldn't notice you lost money until 5 cents of every single dollar in your wallet was gone. Now notice what happens with that. That means the birds have already habituated to the location and they're already doing their damage. So by the time he calls you, you keep losing time. The birds are gonna keep eating because a producer's gonna, remember this is 5% is when they notice the damage. When are they gonna call you? Maybe when they've lost a third of their crop, 20% of their crop. What's the tipping point before they call you? And by the time you arrive, it may be too late. So this is the frustrating aspect of bird control because birds are transient they come in they depredate a crop maybe the temperature changes they move to a different environment they're so mobile that if you delay control it can often be too late to do anything at all so i would suspect that is one of the key reasons why you have certain businesses 
that specialize in complicated bird work because they're the ones who will put the energy and time in and that they can move either on a national basis or have access to large enough jobs to keep them in business and they can get the clients where you as a wildlife control operator, you as a PMP tend to be more geographically based. You're going to need to struggle with uh, dealing with clients who aren't necessarily maybe producing enough or making enough money to hire you in the first place. So it is a certainly a tough, tough area. But I want you to think about those principles again. Understand that trees that are nearby flocks that are adjacent to flocking areas are going to be more likely to be hit than trees away from flocks. Away from flocks. You have to be thinking about is there something about the coloration of the fruit? Now, in this case, it didn't matter, but in another type of fruit, it could matter. Third, is there an issue of timing? Is there an, fourth, is there an issue of the cultivar? Are certain cultivars, we know this with grass and geese, that certain that geese like certain types of grass and avoid other types of grass. It doesn't mean they can't power through but just like ice cream, we all may like ice cream, but we all probably don't like the same flavor, right? So if we have push come to shove, we may hold our nose and eat, you know, eat, eat a flavor we don't like. However, if we have a choice, we're probably going to go for the flavor we like first, right? Birds are going to be no different in this. So understanding principles of bird work it's going to be important so that way when you tell a person change the cultivar you also need to tell them understand that if the birds have a choice between starving and eating a bad cultivar they're going to eat the bad cultivar so always keep this in mind when you are looking when you're considering bird type damage what, what type of species are we dealing with are they migratory are they protected species are they unprotected species what exactly are they eating? This is why your wildlife can calendar, and I've talked about this in a previous podcast, why the, your, you should have, you should be keeping up to date your wildlife calendar. So definitely keep that in mind. All right, well, kind of a short podcast here today. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant. Again, do take a few moments Tell us how we're doing. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Do take some time to subscribe to our channel. Visit us on Facebook. Join our group. Join the revolution and participate. And uh, definitely love to hear from you. Again, thanks for listening and be safe out there because, again, this is called living the wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.